Alonso Perales uh, is an interesting person, and although he's not well known, he is very important in the history of lawyering in Texas. He is the second Mexican-American lawyer uh, from Texas. He is originally a Texan, went away to school and came back. And the reason he's so interesting is because uh, although he made a very successful living as a lawyer, he was really a public intellectual uh, of the sort that was a public intellectual in those days. He was uh, one of the early presidents of the League of United Latin American Citizens, a very important uh, and historically valuable organization, solidarity organization among Mexican Americans, founded in 1929 in Corpus Christi. And he not only served as uh, early president, but uh, he was very active in the association for a number of years as well as predecessor organizations. Uh, he also had a very full life as a newspaper columnist, often writing columns, uh, pointing out the, the various legal perfidies practiced against Mexican Americans at the time, particularly uh, the failure to deliver benefits to Mexican American uh, veterans after the, the various wars, uh, the uh, long standing opposition to Mexican Americans living in public housing, uh, and so forth. And, uh, he wrote about these. Uh, he also tracked them very carefully and so published several books, self-published several books on the issues, the rights of uh, people to have accommodations, to go into restaurants and so forth, all before federal law allowed persons to do so. In addition, he was a diplomat. He served as a diplomat uh, in Latin America and uh, maintained a, a correspondence with everybody from uh, various Mexican-American lawyers early on and other public figures, uh, General Somoza uh, and other persons. Uh, and so he's very important in uh, both Texas history and political science, United States political history and science, uh, and political science, and of course uh, uh, in, in the rise of Mexican-American lawyers. He was one of very few uh, even in the 1950s, there were just simply a handful of these lawyers. They were very courageous because the, the forces arrayed against them, including their uh, inability to get hotels in small towns where they were trying cases and so forth, uh, were very evident. And uh, he constantly exhorted uh, Mexican Americans to hold their elected officials' feet to the fire. He did so himself, probably at some personal cost. Uh, but he's a very important person, and we're lucky to have the family uh, papers, uh, his papers that were held by the family for many years. And he was something of a pack rat, and so this particular collection is very important because it not only has uh, correspondence, but a lot of materials from the day, including uh, LULAC materials, uh, other such uh, political materials, and the like. I think that the, the thing that's always struck me about him, and I didn't know much about him before these materials, was um, sort of like an obscure bootleg tape from early Dylan. That is, his materials were legendary, but they weren't available or widely known. Uh, a, a few scholars, a handful of scholars, including one or two that who are participating in this conference, uh, had used them, but they'd gone to the family garage where these uh, pack rat materials were simply piled up. So we've now processed them, microfilmed them, uh, digitized them, made them much more available for people. And uh, it's really wonderful to see the record fleshed out in a way that's been so uh, useful and interesting. Uh, he was well known in the Mexican American community, and of course he, he did speak to the larger public, both in English and in Spanish language newspapers. But he wasn't as well known as I think is deserved, in large part because he leaned into the wind, held very unpopular views with the larger majority population, because he, of course, was calling them into account. Uh, a substantial number of Mexican American veterans, for example, uh, uh, either gave their lives or were injured in service, and those who returned did so only to find that they couldn't be served in private restaurants or uh, live in public housing and uh, and so forth. Uh, so that. He uh, had good reason to be angry, but he never cursed the darkness. It's always very interesting. He was always very constructive. Um, and uh, looking by today's standards, probably a little conservative, 
Uh, he also had a strong anti-communist streak that I think may have colored his, his viewpoint. But of course, that was the way the United States was. Isolationist United States uh, was. And um, for someone who had uh, been in the times he was, he reflected the times, but he also uh, reflected uh, Mexican-American intellectual uh, ideology, even though uh, he was not an academic he spent a lot of his time in the in the public light, and I think he holds up really quite well. Uh, moreover, the materials are also very good for uh, the rich sense of others who interacted with him, and a lot of roads led through him. And Texas, more than other states at the time, even states with larger uh, percentages of population that were Mexican-American, like New Mexico, or had, had more Mexican-Americans, such as California, didn't really have the activists particularly the lawyer activists, that Texas did. It wasn't because Texas law schools were very accommodating. It just so happened that Texas is Mexican-Americans Mississippi, and so most of the interesting cases, uh, DSEG cases, public accommodations cases, education cases, and the like, originated in Texas. And so the GI Forum, a veterans organization, and LULAC, a civic uh, solidarity organization, and others grew up here in Texas. Uh, and spread nationally, uh, as did the Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund, which was founded in San Antonio in 1968. So he lived a very rich and full life, and it coincides with the rise of uh, Mexican-American uh, political science and uh, uh, public intellectual life.